This video is for anybody interested in the humanistic approach to psychology, but it is specifically for the PSYA2 exam and will contain everything you need for both AS and A level. If you would like a copy of the PowerPoint and handouts that accompanies this video, you can tweet me at blonde underscore pretzel or click on the link in the description below. The main psychologists you need to know about for the humanistic approach are Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers. Humanistic psychology emerged in the 1950s and it soon became known as the third force in psychology alongside the psychodynamic and behaviourist approaches. It challenged both of those approaches because Rogers thought that Freud, in the psychodynamic approach, had dealt with the sick half of psychology, whereas the humanistic approach is concerned with healthy growth for each individual person and something called self-actualization, which is where you reach your full potential. It challenged the behaviourist approach because it emphasised focusing on discussion of conscious experiences rather than relying on the, exper on the experimental method of behaviourism, such as Pavlov and Skinner's experiments on dogs and rats. The humanistic approach focuses on free will and personal responsibility rather than assuming someone's behaviour is determined by biological or external forces, which we'll look at in more detail now. Humanistic psychology says that each individual has the free will to make choices and how they behave as an adult. And it's saying that people are not a slave to outside forces, which is in complete opposition to the deterministic approach, which says that your behavior is determined by internal or external forces other than your own free will to do something. So for example, in the psychodynamic approach, it would say that your behavior as an adult is determined by your unconscious and that your unconscious mind would have been built up from childhood experiences and your relationship with your parents. But the humanistic approach rejects that and says that you still have, you may be affected by outside forces, but you still have free will to make your choices and it should take personal responsibility. So the humanistic approach says that each human is unique and psychology should study subjective experiences rather than apply general laws to explain behaviour. So that's saying that each human being is completely unique and so when it says to study the subjective experiences, it's looking at each individual's life, each individual's experiences and how that is affecting their behaviour but still with that idea that you've got the free will to make your own choices in how you believe, in how you behave. Maslow created something called the hierarchy of needs, which is a theory that says as humans, we are motivated to achieve certain things in a set order. Maslow said we can't jump levels, but we must achieve one level on the hierarchy before we are motivated to achieve the things on the next levels. He said the first four levels are called deficiency needs, which means that if we are deficient in those things, we're going to be solely motivated to achieve them before we even think about anything on the higher levels. The ultimate goal is self-actualization, which is a growth need to reach our full potential. So we're just going to briefly look at the five levels of the hierarchy of needs and this picture of a homeless man in France represents someone right at the bottom of the hierarchy. Because this man is homeless he is going to be solely motivated in finding water, shelter, warmth and food and Maslow says that that is all that he's going to want to achieve. He won't be thinking about the other levels because those most basic physiological needs should be met first. Maslow says that once you have your physiological needs met, then you're going to be motivated to achieve your safety needs. And that includes things like having a secure job, a secure home, and that you feel safe in your environment. Once you have your physiological and safety needs met, Maslow says you're motivated to find love and belonging. And so that includes things like intimacy, having children, having a family, close friendships. So Brad and Angelina um, have been married quite some time and have six children, maybe even more by now. Um, and so that represents the love and belonging needs. The fourth level on the hierarchy is esteem needs, and it's talking about self-esteem 
but in particular it's looking at your esteem in society. So how do people view you in society? And it's often looking at things like wealth and success. So I've put photos of Amelia Clark and Kit Harrington who are incredibly successful in their field and they would have high esteem in society. They've got a huge fan base, people respect what they do and they represent people who have their esteem needs met. Right at the top of the hierarchy is something called self-actualization, and that's when you reach your full potential. It's nothing to do with um, money or love or who likes you. Self-actualization is something you do that makes you feel absolutely brilliant, elated. Um, I've got a photo there of um, Ashley and Pudsey from Britain's Got Talent, and Although she is um, both the, the dog and Ashley are very successful, she would have started training with the dog because it's something that she really, really enjoyed. And when she did it, she would have had flashes of inspiration and feelings of elation. And those are peaks of self-actualization. Maslow says you can't self-actualize all the time, but when you're doing something that you really enjoy for personal fulfillment, you have these um, moments of brilliance where you don't doubt yourself at all. Um, there's also another picture there of some students at the university and that's because education is a significant indicator of um, self-actualization because it's seen as a measure of people's desire to better themselves. So students who study because they want to, not because they're forced, are often self-actualizing and of course they won't self-actualize all the time but they'll have moments of brilliance, moments of this is what it's all about, this is what I want to do, it all makes sense. Um, and that is self-actualization. If you have a look in the um, description below, you'll see a couple of links to um, Britain's Got Talent where you can see all the people on that program. They're there because they wanted to be um, accepted and do well, but all the practice that they did on their own before they got there represents self-actualization. Maslow found that most of the people who self-actualize share certain characteristics. They tend to be creative people who are accepting of others and they have an accurate perception of the world around them. So now we've looked at Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I'd like you to do a practice activity or three practice activities. The first is to choose a fictional person from film or TV or or a book and explain where they are on the hierarchy of needs and describe situations that have caused them to go up and down the hierarchy. I choose something that you really like, I'm a bit of a Breaking Bad fan so I might do mine on the character Jesse, but choose someone, choose a program that you like or a book and explain how that person has gone up and down the hierarchy, like what's happened to them. Then I want you to have a look at today's papers, um, have a look online or go and find a real paper if you've got one. And I want you to find five stories which represent different stages of the hierarchy, so one for each level. And then the third thing I want you to do is find examples of people in the media who have self-actualized and be specific in explaining why they have self-actualized. And remember that fame and fortune come under esteem needs. So someone won't self-actualize just by becoming famous. So I've put some examples there, there's Tim Peake, obviously an astronaut, you should know about him. Uh, everything that he did leading up to him becoming an astronaut and including becoming an astronaut would have caused him to self-actualize, to have those peaks of brilliance. Um, and I've also put Holly Willoughby there. She's a famous TV presenter. She's recently had a book published called something like Truly Happy Baby. And as far as I'm aware, no one asked her to write that. So she's got a very busy career, busy person, but there was something inside her which drove her to write a book to put down her experiences of motherhood. And so really it's the publishing of that book that represents the self-actualization. So I want you to find at least two other people in the media and be specific about why they are self-actualizing. This activity took about half an hour in class, so I would pause the video here and spend half an hour on this activity. Humanistic psychology requires people to focus on the self and there's something called the self-concept and the self-concept is how you perceive yourself. 
So it's made up of how you see yourself in terms of your appearance and the different roles that you have. So try that now, spend a few minutes, just write down how you genuinely see yourself. Remember, no one else is gonna see this. How do you genuinely see yourself in terms of your appearance and how do you see yourself in terms of the different roles that you have? So list those roles. Like the first one is obviously student, um, but you'll have many roles. And when you've written those down, have a look at that because that makes up your self-concept. It's how you perceive yourself. Rogers claimed that people have two basic needs. One is a positive regard from other people, so wanting other people to see you positively. And the other is a feeling of self-worth, so what you think about yourselves. And Rogers says you want to have a good feeling of self-worth. He says that how we think about ourselves, so our self-concept, and our feelings of self-worth are closely linked to our psychological health. So if you feel that you don't have, uh, if you don't have a good self-concept, if what you wrote down is negative, and I really hope that's not the case, and if it is, you should really consider um, seeing a counsellor to talk about that, because your self-concept is very closely linked to your self-worth, which is linked to your psychological health. So if it's a negative self-concept, it's gonna make you feel like you're not worthy, and that's gonna make you feel maybe sad, anxious, maybe depressed, um, and it's really just not a good thing. So your self-concept comes from how you see yourself according to your appearance and your roles, but Maslow says it also comes from what we are told as children, which is then internalized. So often when we're children, we're told things, especially by our parents, about what we're like. So hopefully that would have been positive things like you're funny, you're gorgeous, you're clever. Um, and so that internalizes and that's what you truly believe about yourself. On the flip side, some parents might say things that are um, negative, such as you're lazy or bone idle or stupid or fat. And if that's the case, those things become internalized. So they may not necessarily be true, but as an adult, you truly believe that about yourself. That is how you see yourself as fat or ugly or stupid or lazy. Um, Rogers also said it comes from physical attributes. So what you look like, which we've said about already. Also how you judge yourself according to what you succeed and fail in. So if you, um, I don't know if you're doing your swimming badges and you don't manage to pass them, um, then that failure might become a part of who you are. So you might believe therefore that you're a failure or you might believe that you're a winner. Um, or it, it may be that you keep trying at something and so therefore you believe that you know, you're, you, you're a hard worker. The ideal self represents a view of ourselves as we feel we should be and would like to be. So the ideal self is how you really want to be and that might be different to your self-concept or your actual self. So the next term you need to know is called congruence. And if you think about that in terms of maths, you know that it means if something's congruent, then it's in line with something else. Congruence in this instance talks about whether your self-concept is in line with your ideal self. So really you're looking at self-concept versus ideal self. Are they, an, are they congruent or are they incongruent? So if there is a mismatch between our actual self, our self-concept, and our ideal self, Rogers says we become troubled and unhappy. So the example I've got here is your ideal self is that you're an A-grade student, but your actual self is that you are an E-grade student. And Rogers says that that mismatch causes unhappiness and it causes feelings, it gives you doubts of self-worth. Rogers says we need congruence of actual self and ideal self in order to have feelings of self-worth, positive feelings. Um, he did acknowledge that complete congruence is rare and that people might use denial to deal with the slight incongruences. So just have a think about why complete congruence is totally rare and come up with some ideas for that. The next thing we're going to look at is the role of conditions of worth. And this relates to something called unconditional positive regard. And humanistic psychology requires that everybody has unconditional positive regard for all other human beings. So if you have unconditional positive regard for someone, this means it is without conditions on their behavior. 
you have a positive regard for all humans no matter what they have done. So it's not an easy thing to do. Would you have unconditional positive regard for, for Hitler? The humanistic approach would not condone the behaviour by Hitler, but would still view him with unconditional positive regard. So I've put why, why do we need to have unconditional positive regard? And it comes back to what Roger said about a basic human need being that we need unconditional positive regard from people. We want to be regarded positively by them. And if we're not, then we're just totally switched off. So if a humanistic therapist was trying to work with Hitler, but didn't give him unconditional positive regard, then Hitler would just stop working with that therapist and would never um, progress or in their own personal growth or self-actualize. Obviously Hitler's dead now, but it's just an example of someone that most people in society would view him as um, just pure evil, I suppose, and wouldn't want to work with him. But a humanistic psychologist would see the person beneath the behavior and want to work with them to help them change. So what happens if acceptance comes with conditions? If that happens, then something called conditional positive regard happens, which is the flip side to unconditional positive regard. It's when people are only accepted when they do what others want them to do, so with conditions, and therefore they therefore develop something called conditions of worth. So when someone is only loved and accepted for who the other person wants them to be, rather than for who they really are, unconditionally, it can seriously damage their self-worth. And you can see why that would happen, because if they're constantly trying to live up to the expectations of somebody else, they will end up presenting a kind of fake version of themselves, and with their real self being completely overlooked, and it's going to leave them feeling very um, worthless. This picture here is of Chantelle Horton, who married someone called Preston from The Ordinary Boys. And when they got married, I remember she dyed her blonde hair completely dark brown. And at the time I thought, is she trying to be something that Preston wants her to be rather than what she really is? Now that's completely guesswork on my behalf. It's not a real example. It's just a, a fake example. Um, but perhaps you can think of your own examples from your own experiences. So do you know people in your lives who perhaps they've got a new boyfriend or a new girlfriend and they seem to completely change to be what that person wants them to be? What happens to their true personality and what happens to the relationship? Does it last? Um, I know I can think of examples of when people have broken up and, and when they've broken up, one of the side of the of the couple say, oh, I'm just so relieved. I just feel like myself again. And it seems that they were constantly trying to live up to what someone else wanted because they felt that the love wasn't unconditional, but it was conditional. So you can see that that really damages somebody's um, self-esteem, somebody's self-worth. So there's an activity for you to do. Um, could you read the Guardian newspaper article called Should Parents Ever Comment on Their Daughter's Weight? There's a link to it in the description below, or if you're one of my students, it's on handout AP09. Um, and then just answer the questions and show how uh, parents commenting on their daughter's weight means it creates conditions of worth. Rogers believe that an individual's psychological problems, so perhaps something like depression or anxiety, um, Rogers thought that these psychological problems were a direct result of their conditions of worth, so that someone in their lives hadn't given them unconditional love and acceptance, but put conditions on them. So Rogers believed that with humanistic counselling, people would be able to solve their own problems in constructive ways and hopefully move towards becoming a person who can self-actualise and get over their psychological problems. So the humanistic counselling is based on the fact that the therapist sees everybody as an individual and understands that everyone is different. They give everybody unconditional positive regard and have a non-judgmental attitude to all their clients. They actively listen to the clients and empathise with them. And they work hard to understand a person's self-concept so that they can help build their self-esteem and help the, um, like, empower the client towards self-actualisation. Rogers believes that humanistic counselling will help dissolve the client's conditions of worth, help the client become more authentic and more true to their real self, and become the person they really are, rather than what others want them to be. 
So an example of this could be a woman goes to see a humanistic counsellor because she's depressed due to the breakdown of her marriage. And so the um, therapist might say to the woman, how long were you engaged? And she says, oh, only two months, actually. We'd only known each other three months before we got married. And instead of the therapist being judgmental and saying, well, what did you expect? You know, you rushed into it. They might say something like, oh, it sounds like you fell head over heels in love very quickly. And the woman would say, yeah, I did fall head over heels in love. You're right. And then the therapist would start asking more questions and it might come out that they'd gone on holiday and the woman says, went on holiday and my marriage partner just um, got drunk with these people we met and didn't spend any time with me. And I, you know, I kept trying to get involved and, you know, joking about and I tried, I tried going to watch the big football game with everybody, um, but I just kept getting left out. And the therapist would actively listen to that and say, and reflect something back. So they'd say, hmm, it sounds like you didn't feel valued by your marriage partner. And the woman would say, you're right, I didn't feel valued. And so you can see that the non-judgmental uh, attitude, the unconditional positive regard, and actively listening and empathizing with the person creates a space for the woman to, to actually start to believe in herself again. So really the therapist is almost taking the, the place of that failed marriage partner who should have been the one listening to the woman, should have been the one who was spending time and empathizing. Um, but the failed marriage partner put conditions of worth on the woman. Um, so by seeing the humanistic counselor, she starts to feel um, more like herself again. It's breaking down all those conditions of worth and she starts to realise that she's a good person and to feel more worthy. So that's all of the AO1 and AO2 and now we're going to evaluate the humanistic approach. So you need 10 marks worth of evaluation and the way that we're going to do it is to look at five uh, evaluation points, so kind of two marks per point. So the first one is research support for conditions of worth. So make sure you uh, make it easy for the examiners and come in with a lead and phrase like um, re there is research support for the conditions of worth element of the humanistic approach. And your researcher is Harta et al from 1996 who, who found that teenagers who feel that they have to fulfill certain conditions in order to gain their parents approval frequently end up not liking themselves. Adolescents who create a false self, pretending to be someone they are not, to gain parental love, are more likely to develop depression and lose touch with who they really are. So um, you might want to consider what kind of activities and opinions do you think teenagers pretend to like to gain parental approval? And why would the humanistic psychological approach deem this so damaging to their self-worth? Another strength of the humanistic approach is that Maslow's hierarchy can be applied to economic development as well as being a psychological theory. So Hegarty, 1999, looked at the relationship between economic growth and measures of Maslow's needs levels in 88 countries over a 34 year period. Uh, they found that countries in the early stages of economic development had lower level needs so physiological needs and safety needs, so they would want access to food, and the safety needs were demonstrated by higher murder rates. Whereas countries in advanced stages of economic development demonstrated higher level needs, so those people, um, sh those countries showed more esteem needs like female emancipation and self-actualization that was demonstrated by high levels of educational enrollment. And we know that um, education is significant uh, signifies self-actualization because students who choose to study are more likely to want personal growth which shows the self-actualization. A limitation of the humanistic approach is that Maslow's theory is considered an imposed ethic so it's culturally biased. So remember according to Maslow you can't jump levels in the hierarchy however a cross-cultural study in China by Nevis 1983 found that love and belonging needs were seen as more fundamental than physiological needs in China and self-actualization was defined more in terms of contributions to the community than in individual development so they were less concerned with um, that innate preference to self-actualize that Maslow said we had and their self-actualization actually came from community development. 
Another limitation of the humanistic approach is the research methodology that's used. So it's hard to evaluate the humanistic approach scientifically. Rogers was an advocate of non-experimental research methods because he felt that requirements of experimental methods make it impossible to verify the results of counselling. If the approach is not scientific, it's hard to find support that establishes a causal relationship between variables. Most psychologists argue that without experimental evidence, evaluation of a therapy or theory underpinning it becomes very difficult. So have a look at these questions in pink so you can fully understand this evaluation point. What experimental research methods is Rogers talking about? Why didn't he want to do them? And why does that make it impossible to verify the results of counselling through them? Why is the lack of causation an issue in psychology? Another limitation of the humanistic approach is that critics say it's unrealistic. They think it's an overly idealised view of human nature and they question whether everyone really is inherently good and wants uh, personal growth and self-actualisation. They think it's an oversimplified approach and that not everybody is born with this innate desire to self-actualise. You only have to watch the Jeremy Kyle show for a few minutes to see what these critics are talking about. The Jeremy Kyle show seems to be characterised by issues such as um, people stealing or taking drugs or having one night stands and they seem to be living in the moment, not really focusing on being, um, on wanting to have personal growth. So the critics argue that not everybody wants to, however remember that the humanistic approach um, would disagree and would look at all these people on the Jeremy Kyle show as individual human beings who do want to, to personally grow. So Jeremy Kyle is notorious for um, laying into his guests and calling them disgusting little drug addicts, I think I heard on one of the shows, um, whereas the humanistic approach would look at each person and think about and talk to them to try and help them work out why they've got into the situation they're in. And a humanistic psychologist would truly believe that every person has the potential for self-actualization. So it's up to you really which side of the argument you take, whether you're a critic of the humanistic approach or whether you are a, a humanist yourself, non-judgmental and somebody who wants to help people and see the best in them. So that's the humanistic approach to psychology. You've got a short answer test on either Tuesday the 28th or Thursday the 30th of June, depending on which group you're in, if you're my students, um, and also a timed essay for Friday the 9th of September. So make sure you're well prepared for that. Uh, okay.